Pushkin. The furthest away I've ever been from home was when I went to Japan. A popular travel website that helps people temporarily rent out their homes asked me to make a podcast pilot about the positive experiences people had using their service. Since I needed the money and Not Lost wasn't off the ground yet, I agreed. I told my friend Lars about it over drinks one night, and he flagged a potential problem. The thing is, the only stories people really want to hear about from a company like that is what went wrong. The horror stories, you know? The guests that left the door unlocked and a bear wandered in. The homeowner who set up a secret camera. The renter who was looking for Q-tips and found a box of nail clippings. That last example seemed a little too specific, but I was too scared to ask if he was making it up. Of course, the company didn't want to highlight horror stories. Instead, the list of suggestions they sent was filled with charming anecdotes about how their service had enhanced people's lives. One was about an adopted woman who rented a place in another state that turned out to be the home of her biological sister. Heartlifting? Sure. But also, a bit like the beginning of an A24 horror film. And that's how I found myself on a business class flight to Japan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard. If I was going to get paid to tell happy stories, I might as well make the most of it and book a ticket for the most interesting destination on their list of ideas. First stop was Tokyo, but my ultimate destination was Nagoya, the fourth most populous city in Japan. The story I was tracking down came from a man named Kenzo. Kenzo was a self-described businessman who was raised in Nagoya. His elderly parents were struggling financially when he heard about the company's service. Years ago, his parents had bought an old farmhouse in the country, where, allegedly, samurai once trained. Now, the family rented out the house on the company's website, and Kenzo's mother had become a thriving entrepreneur, like an elderly Japanese Gwyneth Paltrow or a pre-prison Martha Stewart. Upon arriving in Nagoya, I met up with Aiko, a local journalist who I'd arranged to have translate for me. As we wandered around the city, I felt a kinship with the place. As a native of Philadelphia, a gritty, second-tier industrial city kind of spoke to me on some level. We stopped for lunch and had chicken cutlets drenched in Nagoya's preferred ingredient, a red soybean paste made of hacho miso, bonito stock, and sugar. Its oozy, salty tang reminded me of Philly's preferred ingredient, cheese whiz. After lunch, we met up with Kenzo a tall, youthful 51-year-old wearing a brand-new putty-colored winter vest, stylish sweatpants, and Gucci sneakers. They sent you here from New York, he said, quizzically. I said yes. A half-smile crossed his face. Then he disarmed the alarm on his Audi, and we piled in. The tidy gray buildings of industrial Nagoya gave way to the earth-colored hills covered with cedar trees and dotted with rice paddies. After driving for an hour, we pulled into a tiny village, 10 buildings in a valley. We drove up to the biggest house in town. Its silhouette, classically Japanese, big broad walls with dark swooping roofs of Japanese tile. It was an impressive space. But immediately, I noticed something was amiss. The doorways to the house were pretty narrow. I'm not sure an average American could walk straight through let alone a big samurai wearing armor and a katana. A commotion came from a small building adjacent to the farmhouse, which looked to be a servant's quarters. Kenzo exhaled deeply and asked us to stay put as he rushed away. Aiko and I walked around the grounds and saw incongruously a modern patio with the barbecue and two Adirondack chairs. A few minutes later, Kenzo emerged, holding the arm of an elderly woman wearing a cleaner's onesie with a handkerchief in her hair. There was a smudge on her face, along with a look of both defeat and defiance. Brendan, this is my mother Mizuko. I said hello and bowed slightly and presented her with a little box of chocolates I'd picked up in Nagoya after Aiko told me visitors in Japan were expected to bring gifts. 
Mizuko lightly nodded her head in my direction and avoided looking at the gift. Kenzo took it from me. Ah, dark chocolate, my favorite. Mizuko walked away, muttering something in Japanese. What did she say, I asked Aiko? Time for me to make your damn lunch, Aiko said, giggling. Come, let me give you a tour of the property, said Kenzo. His gold watch flashed in the sun as he pointed out the wired fence they'd put up to keep out wild boars. And he was careful not to get his Gucci sneakers muddy near the chicken coop. He told me about how, as an only son, he was obligated to take care of his parents. And even though he was successful and able to do it, he felt that just giving money to his parents depressed his mother, that she had wanted to contribute in some way, but entering the workforce now, after being out of it for so long, would be difficult for her. Thanks to the new company, the company that had sent me business class from NYC to record this conversation, his mother's depression, according to Kenzo, had lifted. My mother says I saved her life, Kenzo said, pushing his highlighted hair to the side of his forehead. Your company saved her life. I winced. It was a moving story, but a little on the nose. It reminded me of the countless interviews I've done with actors where their publicist is in the room, one talking point after another. I would usually not use those interviews for their lack of honesty, but in the world of SponCon, that's sponsored content for the morally pure among you. We're all actors parroting out talking points. With a few edits, this chat with Kenzo would make for a great scene. After a tour of the grounds, we sat for lunch on pillows around a long, low, wide table. Mizuko brought out bowls and sloshed miso soup into them with a wooden label. When she served Kenzo, it splashed up and left a dot on his putty puffy vest. He muttered under his breath. Mizuka said something back, and then they both raised their voices and quickly moved to the kitchen, where I could hear them continue bickering. While they were out of earshot, Aiko told me that she spoke with Mizuko while Kenzo was giving me a tour. I think things are a little different than we thought, she said. Mizuko told Aiko that she missed living in Nagoya, and that the only reason she was at the samurai house was because Kenzo pressed her to move back here and take care of the house so he could make money renting it. Meanwhile, Kenzo was living the bachelor life back at the family apartment in Nagoya. Hmm, so maybe this would be a horror story after all. Or at least a dark A24-style family drama. Kenzo returned, apologized for his absence, and announced he needed to head back to Nagoya. Aiko and I were to spend the night at Samurai House, and he'd be back to pick us up late the next morning. The next day, I woke up early and asked Aiko to interpret for me as I recorded an interview with Mizuko. Over a cup of tea, Mizuko told me about how her husband had found this old farmhouse decades ago on a road trip to get some fresh air. Kenzo was their only child. While Mizuko's husband painstakingly restored the home, Kenzo would pass summers pretending he was a samurai playing in the countryside. After graduating high school, Kenzo went to get an MBA in the United States and returned and worked for a company in Tokyo, but things went poorly, and one day, he returned home to Nagoya and moved back in with him. He seemed depressed. And there he lived, for a while, without working. And then, he learned about the website that allowed people to temporarily rent their homes for money. He told Mizuko and her husband that they had to do it. Besides, it was too cramped with all three of them in the city, and so, since he was her only son, she obeyed him. It was a lot of work for an old lady, and she was growing exhausted, but she supposed it was worth it to support her son. After our chat, I took one more walk around the grounds to record some ambient sounds. As I was about to hit record, I clicked back to my recording of Kenzo the day before and listened as he talked about all the good he had done for his family. I then stopped the recorder. I rewound it to the beginning again and recorded over it. Now, instead of him talking about how grateful his mother was for him and the company, it was all birdsong and trees rustling in the distance. When I got back to New York, I told the company about the unfortunate incident about losing the tape of Kenzo's story. But I also told them not to worry. I had a solution. 
Instead of a story about a mother converted into an entrepreneur, I would tell the story of a mother who loved her son so much, she did all she could to help him. And that's what I did. Not really sure what the company made of it. They didn't provide a lot of feedback, and as far as I know, the story has never seen the light of day. I did get paid, though. When I received my check, I took my friend Laris out for drinks again, and I told him about how the story I'd been sent to get turned out to be different once I was there. I told him about Mizuko and how I taped over my conversation with Kenzo, and I told him that someone should open a lunch truck that makes cheesesteaks with hacho miso paste. Laris sipped his beer. Yeah, but the story about how you had to override the story, that's the best story of them all. You should do stuff like that on your show when you finally get one. And so, that's what I did. I'm Brendan Francis Noonan, everybody, and this is Not Lost Chat, my series of conversations with fellow travelers. On today's episode, we speak to a writer who does the opposite of parachute into a place to tell a preconceived story. For his latest book, The Serpent Coiled in Naples, poet and travel writer Marius Kajakowski lived in Italy's City of the Sun and then shares what he learned. And after that, TV writer, essayist, and comedian Jesse Klein tells us about her preferred mode of visiting places. I do love to sit near the ocean and drink. And that makes her perfectly qualified to help me help you with your travel questions. So stick around, but first, we need to keep the lights on at Pushkin. My first guest today is Marius Kajiowski. He is a poet, essayist, travel writer, and now, after reading him and researching him, my role model. And after you hear him, I hope you'll understand why. Marius was born in Canada to an English mother and Polish father. He then moved to London, where he wrote and made a living in the rare book trade. But he first came on the scene as a poet. His first collection of poems won the Cheltenham Prize, which is an honor he shares with such luminaries as Kazuo Ujiguro and Hilary Mantle. Pretty nice company. And his first prose works were travel writings, primarily on Syria, which is a country he really came to love after spending time there. Of late, Marius has developed a new geographic paramour, Naples. Primarily, he focuses on the people that live there, the merchants, the musicians, the landlords, and he gets to know them by living there. He embeds himself into these communities and immerses himself in research. His most recent book is called The Serpent Coiled in Naples, and The New Yorker put it on their list of best nonfiction books of 2022, which could be part of the reason it was really hard to find. I looked at The Strand in Manhattan. I looked at Powell's in Portland and Elliott Bay and Seattle. No dice. Finally was able to finagle a copy. Anyway, I was very excited to finally dive into it. He is such a wonderful guide. Uh, and that's what I asked him to do when we started our conversation. I asked him to take me and you, listeners, on an imaginary tour of his Naples. Right. Um, well, if we're walking, I think we would go up from the Bay of Naples, up the Via Roma, and towards Spacanapoli, which is the old bit of town. And I usually stay in an area called Forcella. You go from Spacanapoli, you cross the Via Duomo, and you're in the crime zone. Even when I talk to Neapolitans and they ask me where I'm staying, they can't believe it. Forcella? Um, it's real. I like the people. I have a wonderful landlady called Melania who has um, just, if you want a picture where, where we are, yes? We're getting, yeah. where I'm leading you to is to Melania's ankle <laughs> upon which she has a serpent tattooed. Now, that's entirely coincidental. She didn't put the serpent there in order to fit the theme of my book. Melania <laughs> lives in this um, rather rickety apartment block, which is held together with wooden beams and has been that way 
for decades, ever since the, the earthquake of 1980. So the building could topple at any time, I suppose. But then so could the whole of Naples. <laughs> it's, it's complex, and you do such a mm. uh, marvelous job bringing your reader into the uh, maelstrom of history and ideas and characters. Um, mm. the, the Serpentine that's on the foot, uh, also sh- sh- the title of your book came before you encountered her, it seems, The Serpentine of Naples. It did. You, the, the quote, I believe, is, um, never fear Rome, the Serpentine uh, lies coiled in Naples. Yes. My temera Roma il serpenta senasta atrocellato a Napoli. Don't fear Rome, the serpent lies coiled in Naples. As soon as I read that, and even without knowing exactly what it meant, there was my title, The Serpent Coiled in Naples. I've never done that before. I've never gone into a situation or to a place with a ready-made title, but it was a gift, as it were. Yeah. And you spend the book unpacking that title, Mm -hmm. but... There's another quote. If you open all the doors of Naples, Rome disappears. To yes. situate what Naples means in the mindset of Italians, and I would broaden it to say <laughs> Europeans, mm. um, talk about that crosstown rivalry uh, and what Naples represents. I mean, there is, of course, a constant rivalry between the north and south of Italy. And, of course, you see this exemplified, particularly at football games, you know, they're really out to kill each other. But there is something else which distinguishes Naples from any other big city in Italy, uh, which is, I think, hugely important. If you go to Venice, if you go to Florence, you go to Rome, the old centers of those places have now been given over to tourism, restaurants, whatever else. Whereas in Naples, you're still looking at at a center which is occupied by the original people. And that makes it unique. I had this beautifully illustrated for me a few years ago when a lady showed me a stretch of pavement and she said, take a look at this groove in the stone. You know, a simple shallow groove and she said and follow it and it led to a fishmonger and she said that groove is centuries old and as you'll see the fishmonger is still here now that (laughs) that was one of the most invaluable lessons i had about naples right that's such a striking moment there's water that's been dripping from this fishmonger's cart and shop for centuries, which caused that groove. You know, it it also reminds me, at one point you write, blood, tears, and semen have seeped into and oozed from every crack of this old town center, (laughs) Um, which I think does get across the kind of uh, dankness and richness of Mm. these impoverished quarters of Naples. To pick one of those, uh, you talk a lot about blood in this book. It's ever-present. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, yes. Blood, well... When I wrote that line, I was thinking in particular of the great composer Gesualdo, who discovered that his wife was having an affair and came home late one night, caught them at it, and stabbed both of them to death Hmm. and had their bodies dragged out onto the pavement where they lay for about a week. But of course, that that's just one form of blood. There's also the, the gangs. Indeed. There is one zone in the north of a part of Naples called Scampia. The police don't go into that zone. It's, it's one of the most, well, it is the most violent area in the whole of Europe. You know, you can go out on the street and never be sure whether you're looking at a regular citizen or a killer. Mm. And of course, it's very sad. They say that if you go into any cafe and you buy 
an espresso, a percentage of the price of that espresso will finally end up in the Camorra's pockets. There are also all kinds of other contradictions in that in recent years, Naples has become a much safer place to visit. Why is that? Because the Camorra have put out the message to leave the tourists alone. Why have they done that? Because they own a good bit of the tourist industry. So they, they would like it to be a safe place for tourists. <laughs> you know. And yeah. um, I've never in my time there experienced any trouble. That said, all of that is now being threatened. Naples is becoming more and more of a popular tourist destination, and there is gentrification moving even into Forcella, the tough zone where I stay. And so it's always with a certain amount of um, hesitation that I I recommend places that I love. Mm. You know, tourism is in so many ways the enemy of all that one loves about a place. Yes. And this 17th century churchman and historian Thomas Fuller said that travel makes a wise man better, but a fool worse. <laughs> and unfortunately, you see more fools than wise men on the streets. Mm. You know, so. you know you're, you're putting your finger on, I think, something in a much smaller way I've struggled with, but the burden, for lack of a better word, of a travel writer, mm. which is this compulsion to share, yes. to really take an x-ray on a place and pass that information along. And yet, the closer you get to your subject, the more you want to protect it. Yes. And so, how do you reconcile that tension? What makes you decide to go forward? I haven't, I haven't yet reconciled it. Hmm. I don't know <laughs> if I ever will. Um, you know, in the final chapter of my book, I, I write about going to a particular festa on the slopes of Vesuvius. And it took me months to get on to that. And it was the most wonderful experience for me. But in writing about it, my deepest fear is that I've exposed it. Yes. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, suppose one day a tourist bus goes up that slope <laughs> and tries to join in with the festa. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I would feel incredibly guilty mm. but you still wrote it i still wrote it you still that, you still that's the contradiction yes. you're talking about and it's the one i have not yet resolved myself and i i wonder if i ever will writing is my passion and you know falling in love with a place is in a sense a kind of romance and one wants to be true to what one sees you cite at one point an old joke. Mm. Uh, someone's on a train, and they ask the conductor, when do we arrive in Naples? And he said, hold up your wrist to your eye, look at your watch, and look at the minute hand, and when your watch disappears, you're in Naples. <laughs> yeah, I'll let that fall on your head, not mine. <laughs> you, you, you've got to walk down through the streets of I'll New York it. City. I mean, they have to go through some pretty <laughs> tough neighborhoods yeah. to get to me. <laughs> right, uh, yeah. Mm. That, that might give Naples a run for his money. Well, it's interesting. The preamble, I mean, when you're described, you're described as a poet, an essayist, and a travel writer. And I don't, I don't really see you as a travel writer in that you've written about Naples. Mm. Previously, you've written books about Syria, uh, Damascus. And that's a, another place you're talking about love that you, it seems you fell in love with. Mm -hmm. and, and you really st steep yourself and, and into these cultures, right? Both intellectually as well as physically. Yes. And so, yeah, do you see any distinction between uh, between yourself and, and what's considered a travel writer? Um, I, I think it's fantastic that you raise this question because um, I think I constantly disqualify myself as a travel writer. Um, the reason I'm called that occasionally is so they know where to put me in the bookshops. You know? <laughs> and I think the main reason for that being that I don't travel 
through places so much as I do through the lives of people. Mm. And my thinking is that if you get close to someone, that sooner or later that person will reflect his or her surroundings. I enjoy people. I enjoy their stories. And what their stories tell me is really about the place. Yeah. Yeah. It seems you consult, you do consult with both the living and the dead. So who helps you more, the living or the dead, when you're kind of uh, trying to figure out a place? (laughs) Naples, like nowhere else I've been, the dead are always with you. They're Mm. with the Neapolitans. I had somebody criticize me for saying, oh, you don't talk correctly about the dead. And I said, look, it's not me. It's them. You know, (laughs) uh, it's Neapolitans addressing the dead and the dead addressing them. When Naples won the World Cup with the great Maradona, people rushed to the cemetery to tell the dead, you've no idea what you missed. And, and you know, the whole belief system with the, the skull of cults, which is probably the reason why I went there, is that there is this sort of communication, you know, this flow between the living and the dead, such that there is no barrier left between them. Yeah, you write of going into, um, for example, the volcanic quarries underneath Naples. That's right. And, and, and they're packed with skulls. That's right. And some of them are shiny, burnished, almost like a, like a polished shoe, mm-hmm. because they're touched so often yes. for, for yes. good luck. Yes, indeed, indeed. And, and of course, the skull cult there is, is rather different than that which you will find in Mexico. You adopt a skull, you take care of it, keep it clean, dust it off, you know, now and then. Mm. (laughs) The spirit possessor of that skull will come to you in dreams. Mm. And you can ask questions. But, you know, the Neapolitans being Neapolitan, they tend to ask for for the lottery ticket numbers. Or they used to. They used to. At one point you say... Any place one chooses to map is unmappable. And mm-hmm. so I ask you, why map it? Why, why, why take a crack at this? Well, I'm always cautious when it comes to talking about, let's say, inner journeys. Mm. I've well, always, you're half British. <laughs> yeah, I, I, always, I always felt that's a load of nonsense myself. Mm. You know, one, one goes to learn, one goes to see, but... In terms of that great revolution in the soul that's supposed to take place, I mean, have you ever heard of anything so vain? I mean, it's awful. And I think it I think that very notion has contaminated a lot of um, travel literature. Mm. And I always tell people, you know, go go to a place with modesty and curiosity, but don't go in the expectation of altering the state of your soul. You know, uh, respect and intelligence, that's the way to approach any place. And, of course, in that respect, I've always maintained that the puffballs of peace are sometimes worse than the missiles of war. Tourism is the soft weapon, which is destroying so many places. Mm. Um, I was really shocked when I went to Amalfi for the first time, where every square inch of the center of Amalfi is given over to tourism, whether it's postcards, ice creams, or souvenir shops. I just found it incredibly depressing that you have this beautiful city in the middle of the most beautiful landscape, and yet it's been completely ruined. The very reason that people went there in the first place was to see the magic. The magic is long gone. I think, that's, I think that might be uh, a good place to end. I'm going to encourage you never to listen to my podcast if you don't like personal journeys blended with your travel. <laughs> but <laughs> I think you'll find that my curiosity and interest in 
true local folks and what they have to say is at the heart of my project. Great. Um, thank you for taking the time to chat with me this evening. My great pleasure. My great pleasure. Marius Kajaowski. His latest book is called The Serpent Coiled in Naples, and I encourage you to check it out. We hardly scratched its surface here. It's a really, really rich book. Uh, and honestly, I was hoping that Marius and I would become best friends forever after our conversation, but I kind of have a feeling after he hears me navel-gazing in front of Leonard Cohen's house in Montreal, he'll want nothing to do with me. That's okay. Maybe I'll just stare in front of Marius' house in London at some point in the future. Um, but fortunately for me, after the break, I'm going to be joined by another navel gazy writer, uh, Jessie Klein. She's also a comedian, and I have a feeling she's going to like my style. That is nice. A man with a sports coat with that inner pass, that is kind of a hot moment. Not lost. We'll be right back. All right, we are back here at Not Lost Chat. Um, I am coming to you today from Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn, uh, and I've been commuting more and more here to Manhattan to help make this show. And I've noticed that people are walking slower, like maybe half a mile per hour slower. And that might not seem like much, but it does make a difference when you are walking in the streets every day and have been walking these streets for years. It, it's, a, it's an interesting shift. You can sense it when you're on the stairwell, uh, when you're moving around town. And whether it's related to like post-COVID lockdown disorientation or something else, I don't know. I mean, actually, I do know. Everyone is staring at their phones. But anyway, whatever the reason, it, it really adds to this feeling I've had for the past few months that I don't remember really how to behave around people like I did before COVID. Um, and arguably, I didn't even really know how to behave around them then. So to help me refresh my memory and help other folks who might be in the same boat, uh, I've decided to invite a world savvy guest each week to help answer questions about moving and traveling through the world. And this week, I'm joined by the TV writer, essayist, and comedian, Jesse Klein. She is probably best known for her work on the show Inside Amy Schumer, but she's also written for a ton of other shows like Transparent. She's a consulting producer on the Netflix show Big Mouth, and she writes books too. Her most recent book is called I'll Show Myself Out, Essays on Midlife and Motherhood. And with so much going on in her life, I asked if she even has time to travel. I think an illusion has been created because I'm actually not, I'm... You're unemployed? I feel like I have... I I currently am a little bit unemployed, but I'm not that prolific. I think because of the pandemic, certain things got slowed down that mm. would have like kind of come out along various different years. And then because of COVID, and, uh, have you heard of it? <laughs> it was this virus. Uh, yeah, we, we heard about it in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get it there? Uh, yeah. Anyways. A bunch of things came out at once, and it made it seem like, oh, who's this girl who's just endlessly working? But all of these things took, like, five years of development. And anyways, uh, I don't take vacations. Well, that was but the it's other. it's not really because so, I'm working that hard. It strikes me that you wouldn't be someone who takes a vacation with, like, a coconut with a straw in it kind of vacation. Because <laughs> I'm not that type of person either. Well, I do think about, like, what's my ideal vacation. I do love to sit near the ocean and drink. Okay. Like, uh, I don't go in it a ton because <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. sharks. But to yeah. be near it, looking at it, and drinking like a cold, a Sancerre, I don't know, something. Oh, uh, if okay. it's in a coconut, sure, as long as it's booze. <laughs> but right. I, I feel like I could only do that for so many days. I do like walking through a beautiful city. Okay. I am craving right now some kind of maybe a forest experience. Okay. A forest bath or just forest a walk for or drink <laughs> No, I guess I think at this point in life now just if you're in a forest you're taking a forest bath and if you're hearing sounds you're in a sound bath. Okay. It's just bathing. I don't know. I think that's stage. just the terminology now. I, what what separates walking through a forest from a forest bath? I think you pay someone named after a noun $180 to take a forest bath. <laughs> to take a forest bath. <laughs> yeah, and it involves yeah. incense. Willow. Yeah, Willow's exactly. going to take me on my forest bath. Exactly. Okay, that's helpful. 
So when I was preparing to chat with you, I was reading some interviews you did when your book came out about half a year ago now. Yes. And in one of them, you talked about Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Eat, Pray, Love. Yes. And you said that you've read it a ton of times. I have. And... I mean, I've interviewed Elizabeth Gilbert a couple of times. She's brilliant. I think she's wonderful. So brilliant. But there are only so many books in the world. Um, why would you want to read that one more than once? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, especially when that book came out, I think I was like exactly uh, the strike zone for it. And yeah. just covers, I think, a lot of human experience in a lovely, smart way. I know there was kind of a little bit of a backlash to that book because... I think for reasons that were unrelated to the book or to Elizabeth Gilbert, it became a little bit labeled like with sort of a basic bitch brush. <laughs> but uh, I don't think that's really super fair to it. Having read your earlier book of essays, being familiar with your work with Amy Schumer and other things, you don't strike me as someone who would want to go to Bali and uh, <laughs> kind of like find yourself and get like henna tattoos. But maybe I'm wrong. Uh Uh, definitely not into the henna tattoo. You know, with travel, the day there's a teleporter, I'll go most places. But, Mm. um, I am at my core a little lazy. Mm, mm -hmm. Uh, so a really, really long flight really intimidates me. It's so dumb. Why miss out on beautiful things in the world? Um, because you don't want to go to the airport and be on a plane that long. It's dumb. So it's uh, not it's not the basic bitch stuff that makes you anxious about it. It's not the being in the back of a moped. That stuff totally okay. It's just the actual trip. You, you the don't trip. Want to fly there. I mm. get intimidated by the trip. I I am actually, especially as I creep towards uh, just mm-hmm. getting older and older and older and older. I'm very into the woo woo finding yourself stuff. I would absolutely do that. Have you read the book called Yoga by? Emmanuel Carrera. It's like a, no. it was, it was a hot book. It's what people are reading in New York in the subway. Oh, okay. Please, I help you. Please, yeah. oh, just thought God, I. That's know. one no. of the things I miss about New York is knowing what people like. Yeah, you really are like, what should I read? And you look around and you're like, this is what people are reading. What's that rat reading? What's Pizza Rat looking at? <laughs> what's, pizza, what's Pizza Rat dragging? Is Pizza yoga Rat reading yoga? <laughs> yoga Rat. Uh, anyway, part of it is a guy who goes to this meditation resort. He's been doing those things for years. Uh, and he has to be silent for 10 days. Okay, yeah. Silent is a no mm. uh, for me. I wouldn't do okay. that. And I also, <laughs> I'm realizing, like, I want to caveat finding myself. I will not be quiet. <laughs> and I won't, uh, and I can't, I can't, I won't meditate. Okay, so you are obviously a jet setter. You love to be in a plane. You know, <laughs> well, you'll hop yeah. Yeah, at the drop of a hat. You will uh, <laughs> cash in your travel points and go somewhere. Yeah. So you're perfectly qualified to help um, some of my listeners with their etiquette questions. I would love, I would love to help All if right. I can. Um, this first one comes from Anna from Wyoming. She writes, this is because I've watched so many Real Housewives trips. In a big group, how do you assign rooms in a vacation house? Who gets the smallest room? This is the cause of a lot of stress with big group trips where there's a mix of singles and couples, also on bachelorette weekends. Ooh, that's a really, really good question. That would stress me out. I'm picky as hell. (laughs) Um, And I think at this point, I would probably be one of the people creating the problems. But um, I I agree with you. I would scope the entire joint. I would do some calculus (sighs) in my head and try to get the best room possible without feeling like a jerk. Yeah, I mean, I would say it feels like if there's dedicated organizer to the trip, I would say, like, uh, maybe you're just like, I'm going to assign those rooms. Everyone knows in advance, so there's not that uh, scramble. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think having a leader, like, I even, I'm someone who's pretty picky, but if I know I'm in good hands, as long as it's been thought about, I could be in a less than excellent room. Because I'm like, some, yes. some justice has been administered here. There's been some thought to it. I don't like a free-for-all because I feel guilty because I will win, but then I won't enjoy <laughs> myself. Or I'll go the other direction and take the worst room as like some martyr. I'll be my mother and my father, basically. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't feel good. A free-for-all is so anxiety-inducing. So, Anna, uh, I don't know if we answered. Uh, find a strong organizer and secretly lobby that organizer on the side. Yes. Okay. We have another question from Nicole. Nicole from New Jersey. Due to planes no longer guaranteeing you to sit together unless you pay, do you agree to give up your prepaid seat 
so that a parent can sit with their child? Oh, a hundred percent. Okay. That's just karma points. You're <laughs> now will I do it for just like a healthy couple? No. <laughs> no. 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 Like a healthy, thriving couple. Like a two people who want to canoodle the whole flight long. <sighs> Absolutely no. not. But for a parent and a kid, that's like you got you gotta. You gotta. Yeah. I'm with you on this. As someone who doesn't have a kid, I still think that's a pretty mean, curmudgeonly thing to do, to not give up your seat. I will say, though, now any parent listening will not have to prepay because they're just going to assume people will give them their seat. Can I say on the flip side of all of this, Mm. if you are the parent who was not able to get Mm -hmm. your seats together and someone is doing this kindness for you, and you are showing up at that airport knowing you're going to have to ask this. Mm. You better have some kind of a gift card. A, <laughs> uh, I'm serious. Like, have a thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, have something to offer as a thank you. Because, yeah, the presumptuousness of it, yeah. I think you got to have some kind of little gift card in your pocket for the person. Or at least make the effort, and then the person should not accept it in a way. But you should do the little dance of, like, I'd like to. Yeah. It's yeah. not it's not fair, but it's right. Um, so the peanut gallery, I shared this with the peanut gallery for asking this question. And one parent said, I love the idea of dropping my kid off with a stranger. Good luck. Like if they won't give up their seat, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> like have, have fun with my five-year-old. Yeah, have at it. Yeah, have at it, buddy. They're going to be screaming and freaking. Fine. You're going to smash goldfish falling out of your clothes. Okay. Uh, This question comes from Coco from Miami. The question is, is it weird to take your shoes off on the plane? Uh, It's weird to take your shoes off and not have on a sock. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay with a shoe off if you're in a sock. I can't even imagine who's going to have a barefoot on a plane. What what do you mean you can't imagine? Have you flown in America lately? Well, I mean, I was was thinking of the person who I saw. Oh. Openly clipping their nails on a JetBlue oh, flight. God. Openly oh. clipping their nails. Oh, my God. I was like, are we on the oh. L train? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are we doing? That I mean, sound, that really happened. That sound is like the opposite of a meditation app is oh. that snip. It's like my, the opposite of uh, ASMR, the, the clip of a toenail. Then, <laughs> oh, my God. But shoes, if you have socks, okay. If you have socks, okay, not ideal, but permitted. I have a question. Okay, you're on a plane. You arrive at your destination. You enter your wherever you are, your hotel room, your house, whatever it is. How much time expires between walking through the door and Silkwood showering and getting out of what you were wearing? (laughs) Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I'm a pretty clean dude, but I don't I don't rush into the shower like racked with tears thinking about what just went down in the airplane. Really? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm more Will likely rushing to the bar. Other chairs I'm more like do- or, or like <laughs> sit on other things in the place you're staying in in the clothes you were just on oh, the plane in. When I enter a hotel room, I take off the top comforter and of remove course. the pillows. I mean, of come on, course. that's table stakes. <laughs> Wait, you remove the <laughs> Wait, you remove the pillows? <laughs> the top pillows, like the ones oh, you know, the vanity oh, the pillows. The, oh, oh god, in the trash. Oh, in yes, the trash. exactly next to the comforter. We'll you let time go by. I'd let time go by, sure. Like, my first concern is, like, can I just get a drink? Can I just, like, get, like, I want to get it back into life. I want to be around a friend. Like, I, I want to, like, be in the world again. Into so the, mentally, the mental hygiene sphere. is my, my high priority. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. This is reminding me of a couple things. Okay. Uh, I'm obsessed with this question, and many guests have answered, is on the airplane, what do you wear? Comfort or something else? What is your, what is your strategy for the airplane? I mean, obs comfort, but within limits. Mm. I mean, mm. here's like a thinker for the ladies. <laughs> like the most comfy thing is a yeah. jumpsuit. Like you're kind of in a onesie and it's very comfortable. However, mm. if you're in a jumpsuit, when you go to that bathroom, yeah. you're doing, yeah. you're, mm-hmm. you're in a tits out pee, which just doesn't <laughs> feel great. Like you really are vulnerable. You're vulnerable in that tits out pee, yeah. but you're trading that off for being in, like, your comfiest outfit, so it's tough. But then would you um, burn that outfit upon arrival? I'm not wearing it again, no. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I can't be clear. Wow. I'm not repeating the clothes that touch the seat of the plane. Wow. I, I, I believe strongly in like a good sports coat. Are you dressing up for air travel like a we're in the bit. 60s? A, a little bit. A little bit. Because it's so dehumanizing to go through TSA and to yes. wait for five hours to get, um, you know, a bagel with egg salad and, and iceberg lettuce or whatever it, for $20 <laughs> that I feel like looking kind of like dialed in makes me feel calmer. You know what? I want to address what you're saying because it's very valid. I When I say I'm dressing for comfort, I'm not doing like, you know... Like a juicy sweatsuit <laughs> where yeah. you're just like, fuck you, everyone. Yeah. I'm, fuck I'm, you. I'm clipping my nails. Where are my slippers? You. I'm a sc- <laughs> I want to, yeah, I don't want to look like I've fully given up. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, that's the line. But 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 on the blazer, on the sports coat, yeah. I do feel like it has protective powers. Like, I don't care if it wrinkles. Like, I, I beat it to hell. I use the pockets. I throw my passport in it. And for me, that feels a little bit like armor. And then when I am... At the hotel, or if I go out to dinner afterwards, I'll like take it off, and I, I feel like it kind of like that's kind of what protects my situation. Yeah, you know? yeah, so, yeah. Inner pocket looks so great with the passport in it. People, um, people love it. People <laughs> yeah, love it. you know TSA what? loves that it. That is nice. <laughs> a man with a sports coat with that inner pass. That is kind of yeah. a hot moment. Yeah, with the I ticket have a, peeking yeah, out. Yeah, that's a sophisticated man. I yeah. have a a jacket that I bought as my production jacket. It has six pockets on this jacket it's like a utility and i bought it for set because it was like a headset pocket a purell pocket your mask pocket your phone pocket but for travel it's equal it's also just like all this shit i've got my completely so many pockets now again this is is why robert altman wore one and this is why romancing the stone michael douglas wore one like all those pockets needed in both those scenarios but you have your hand sanny, you have your passport, your you have your ticket, you have your gum. <laughs> yeah, and if you're in one of those uncomfortable situations where sometimes I put myself in where I'm like, I just jump in the seat because I feel like, I don't know, when I'm, when I'm getting into the plane itself, a lot of anxiety, a lot of people angry, a lot of people throwing suitcases up. It's tough out And so there. I just want to get in there. I like have knowing that if I just have to hop in the seat, I, it's all in my pockets. I'm all good. It's all I'm, in your I'm pockets. Care of, so. Is there a better feeling in this world than that moment where you've made it to your seat and you butt down and you bag up and you're just like, I'm in the seat. <sighs> there is a There should be feeling. a German there word. There is a better feeling. There is a better the feeling. Arrival, the arrival? When landing. the doors close and there's no one sitting and, next uh, to you. And like, yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. That the suspense. Is delicious. The suspense of delicious. that empty seat. And then you widen until takeoff so no one will get any ideas. Mm. And then you're in easy street after that. Yeah, you got to wait till that takeoff, uh. too. That's true. Yeah, that's a really good feeling, too. Um, Jesse, thank you so much for coming by and sharing your travel secrets. This was so fun. Thank you. That was Jesse Klein. Her latest book is called I'll Show Myself Out, Essays on Midlife and Motherhood. It's kind of like Eat, Pray, Love, but she's married, has children, and doesn't really go anywhere. So that's it for this edition of Not Lost Chat. If you have travel questions that you want answered in a future episode, you can email them to me at notlost at pushkin.fm or ping me at bfnunam on Twitter. Please send them along. Not Lost Chat is produced by Jordan Bailey, who flew from the Bahamas to L.A. to be able to help assemble this episode. I hope Jordan allows me into the Platinum Club Centurion Lounge if we ever travel together. The show is written and hosted by me, Brendan Francis Noonan. Uh, true story, I recently rented an Airbnb in Montreal for the holiday break, but I was too busy to make the trip. Didn't cancel in time, so I had to pay in full. But I did get a good review from the host. She said, I left the house in good shape. So there you go. Someone who is much better at making plans and keeping them is Laura Morgan, who helps book our show. This episode was edited by Sarah Nix with assistance from the chillest managing producer in the game, Jacob Smith. Our mix engineer, who also provides additional production support, is Sarah Bruguer. Not Lost is a co-production of Pushkin Industries, Topic Studios, and iHeartMedia. It was developed at Topic Studios. And yes, this show has some executive producers, including me, Brendan Francis Noonan, Christy Gressman, Maria Zuckerman, Lisa Langang, and Latal Malad. As always, if you dig what you hear, please tell a friend, tell the seatmate on your airplane if they look like they want to talk with you. 
Uh, you can also make a comment at Apple Podcasts. Spread the word. It's all really appreciated. And if your inbox is lonely, and whose isn't, you can sign up for the Pushkin newsletter at pushkin.fm slash newsletter. And if you want to listen to back episodes of Not Lost or other Pushkin podcasts, then there's some great ones, Story of the Week, Slight Change of Plans. You can listen and find them on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcast. That is it for this episode. Thank you, everybody. Bon voyage.